All of Us Strangers is a compelling demonstration of how filmmaking tools can be employed to unpack childhood trauma and process complex emotions. The narrative revolves around a screenwriter who lives alone in a near empty tower block in London. The story unfolds over one night where he meets this mysterious neighbor who breaks his isolation and alters the rhythm of his daily existence, and somehow compels him to revisit memories of his long dead parents. From the synopsis and the trailer, it's safe to assume that this movie is a queer romance. Upon watching, however, you're still very likely to find out it's much more than that, as it delves into psychological struggles that can be universal utilizing filmmaking techniques and fusing elements from different genres to get its messages across. So here, we'll be having a close look into those specific elements that distinguish the film and help us connect with it in a meaningful way. The movie starts off with an urban landscape shot of London dissolved with another shot of the main character, Adam. This establishes the central mechanism of the film and foreshadows its themes, since we already get the idea that there are two different worlds we'll be exploring, and we can see through the two dissolved images that they are contrasted through the use of opposite colors, red versus blue or warm versus cold, a motive that will keep coming back throughout the movie. The two worlds in question are our reality versus a sort of metaphysical physical space that Adam keeps crossing to. The fact that we have these two realities raises a question around the genre of the movie, which makes it even more interesting. To start, there are three different possible readings of the film based on the visual and narrative cues that we want to focus on. The second shot we get is of Adam sitting on his desk writing a script of a movie. So a first possible interpretation of the film is it simply being a fictional narrative that he wrote down, probably to process his own childhood trauma. The first line he puts down is a description of the suburban house that he will later visit and where he will meet the ghosts of his parents. So that already gives some credibility to this interpretation. Credibility though doesn't mean it's the one and only correct interpretation. There are enough cues that leave the door open for a more literal reading of the film, that being as a ghost story. The main indicator for that, and perhaps the most obvious one, is Adam's parents' refusal to eat or drink anything, which is usually used by writers to hint to the fact that a character is actually a ghost. Another indicator is other characters pointing to the fact that Adam is warm or hot, and that suggests that he is alive, unlike the ghosts of the dead who are usually cold. But again, this is not the one and only definitive reading of the film, since other characteristics usually associated with ghosts are not present. An example of that is all the dead characters or ghosts having reflections in mirrors. And not only do they casually have those reflections, but the movie feels like it deliberately tries to bring our attention to the fact that they do have reflections by using mirrors as a motive. And even when it comes to the drinking motive, it also feels like the filmmakers are playing with us, since we do have a very strong suggestion that the ghost of the father drinks from a cup, but at the same time, we can't really tell if he actually consumed the drink or not because the camera moves away from him, just as he's about to do that. I would argue this is a way to insist upon the movie's openness to various interpretations, where all of these characters are either actual ghost Adam literally meets, or just figments of his imagination that he knows he made up through writing the script. And it doesn't even stop at these two readings. A third possible interpretation is somewhere in the middle. This movie can be realistic, in the sense that the ghosts don't actually exist, but Adam still sees them without knowing that they don't exist. It could all be some sort of hallucination he gets consumed by as a symptom of severe mental illness. One clue we have to support this theory is a scene near the end of the restaurant that Adam goes to with his ghostly parents. When he orders a family meal, the waitress explicitly shows her surprise when she says that it's a lot of food. This suggests that Adam goes on all of these trips in reality where other people, like the waitress, can actually perceive him, but not see the ghosts he's interacting with. So what do all of these possible readings say about the genre of the movie? I believe that the closest thing in that regard is the fantastic, which is a term introduced by literary theorist Toradov, which describes stories that are characterized by hesitation or ambiguity between two readings, the supernatural and the natural, with plausible suggestions and evidence for both interpretations simultaneously, which is exactly what we have in this movie. It's also important to note though that All of Us Strangers marks a departure from its source material when it comes to genre. 
The movie is a loose adaptation of the 1987 novel Strangers by Japanese writer Taichi Yamada, which was an example of a traditional Japanese ghost story, and so directly belonged to the horror genre. All of Us Strangers moves away from that by blurring the lines between the real and the supernatural, turning it into a fantastic narrative, but also by foregrounding the element of romance while making a major change to the sexuality of the main character, who was heterosexual in the novel. But then again, as we see, the movie doesn't go that far away from the source material since we do have the possible reading of it as a ghost story, but also have several horror elements that mark it, like the scene where Adam takes Harry to his childhood home, which looks like a typical horror movie scene. There's also the graphic description of the eyeballs, the scene where Adam is followed by the ghost of his father, and overall there is constant subtle incorporation of horror elements all over the movie that pay tribute to the novel. There's also the nod to the most well-known writer in the genre Stephen King in the scene where the mother brings up some of his titles, which are the director's favorite works. So in the end, do we can agree that the movie is a mixture of romance, horror, and the fantastic? But a question that remains is why? Why choosing to tell the story this way? And to answer that, we just need to look at the thematic makeup of the film. At its core, All of Us Strangers is a movie about processing childhood trauma, and one way to process that trauma is to revisit the memories that keep it alive. One efficient way to convey that through a movie is to structure it around the idea of going between two worlds in a literal sense. Blurring the line between the two worlds is a powerful move since it speaks to the vividness and solidity of that experience. Experience. Revisiting past traumas might be only psychological, yes, but the reaction it evokes in us can feel very real, so it makes sense to express it in a literal way. That path between the present reality and past trauma is literalized in the film through the use of the motive of trains. Every time the main character hops on a train, we know that we're about to cross to this other metaphysical dimension. The emphasis on trains in the movie in general is an interesting one. It might be a stretch, but we can think of it as a means of transportation that contrasts cars, and cars where Adam are associated with his parents' death, so they seem to be a symbol of his trauma. This motive of the car reappears in pictures of his childhood and the conversation with his parents about the red pedal car. Adam seems to have buried the love he once had for cars as a child because of the accident, and that might explain his exclusive use of public transportation like trains in the movie. The crossing from reality to fantasy is is also demonstrated in editing through dissolved transitions or motion blurs. The fantastic world we move to is characterized by this ethereal atmosphere. White lightning is utilized in the scenes with the parents to stress their ghostly nature and give us this sense that they are on the verge of leaving at any moment. Another subtle motive that marks the movie visually is mirrors. We have many scenes where characters' reflections in mirrors are very pronounced, like the scenes in the elevators. There might be a more significant reason for their use, but a simple guess would be that mirrors symbolize the duality at the core of the film between two different realities. Another aspect they can possibly point to is film's reflexivity. After all, our main character is a screenwriter. So in a sense, this could be a movie about screenwriting and filmmaking and how they can mirror our complex realities and be a means to process our traumas. Another theme that the structure of the film helps us to communicate is loneliness. The divide between the real world and Adam's fantasies speaks to his isolation. His loneliness is central to this movie as it is to the character's psyche, and he spells that out for us clearly when he expresses how he's always felt lonely even before the death of his parents. But there are more subtle ways in which loneliness is expressed in this film. To start, the character's job is one that's isolated in nature, and his father sort of pointed that out when he said that writers know less about the real world than anyone else. The setting is also designed in a way that stresses that isolation, as we have a lot of the shots with Adam in his apartment contrasted with images of the outside world, mainly the large crowded cityscape of London. A lot of the time, the camera is placed to emphasize that isolation further. The film is dominant by close-up shots of Adam, and we see him in a lot of shots trapped within some form of space, like windows or door frames. Sound design helps with that as well, since we have Harry pointing to the silence earlier in the movie, which highlights the character's disconnect from the rest of the world. Lightning and color are also used to emphasize that division. As I said earlier, the shades of blue and red dominated almost the entirety of the movie in a way that suggests that their use is purposeful. For one, these two colors can be associated with the police car, 
that brings Adam the devastating news that would change the course of his life. But an even more substantial guess we can make is that shades of blue and cold colors represent the loneliness that Adam feels and every other emotion that comes with it, like terror and fear. They are indeed present whenever Adam is alone or when he talks about his loneliness. Whereas warm colors, mainly shades of red, represent a sense of love, security, and protection. And so they dominate the scenes where Adam is in the presence of his parents. As for his scenes with Harry, we get a mixture of both colors, mainly in the club and during their interactions. We only settle on red lightning towards the end where they are together in bed in a moment that feels warm and peaceful. The theme of loneliness goes hand in hand with another crucial theme in the film, which is queerness. At multiple instances, the relation between queerness and loneliness was brought up by Adam, characterized by this sense of ambiguity. When his mother brings up the topic, he admits to being lonely, but still clarifies that it's not because he's gay. However, even when he does that, there are traces of uncertainty in his expression, mainly the phrase, not really, which points to the nuanced nature of this relation between queerness and loneliness. That is also developed further through the character of Harry, who describes the isolation he was subjected to after coming out as being drifted to the edge. To link this back to all that I said on the visual aspect of the film, that sentiment is represented through the contrast between the space that Adam and Harry occupy and the outside urban life of London, from which they are so distant that they don't even hear the sounds that must come out of it. That's how the remark that Harry makes at the beginning of the movie turns out to have a more powerful link to one of the core themes of the film, which is queerness, expressed by a strong feeling often linked to it, which is loneliness. You see here how every element in the film is connected, even the smallest details. Queerness, of course, isn't only represented in relation to the feeling of loneliness, but by virtue of being a queer protagonist, Adam's character offers a subtle commentary on the queer experience through his expressions and interactions with other characters. We learn through his coming out scene about how shaky our perception of queerness can be. Since on the one hand, we have Adam's mother who shows surprise when he comes out to her and specifically says that he doesn't actually look queer. And on the other hand, we have the father who claims that it's so obvious that he had known about it since Adam was a child. These moments can be reflective of Adam's experience with others who might or might not identify him as queer. Other relevant issues are briefly explored like stereotypes associated with gay men like not being able to play football, crossing legs, being bullied, or the simple act of crying. Questions on the evolution evolution of gay rights are also entertained through the constant mention of the way things have changed or the use of words related to queerness. Overall, this movie provides a lot to queer viewers to identify with and see explored in an interesting format and structure. The fantastic dimension can offer a queer person such as Adam a place to process all of the complicated feelings he's developed because of his identity that, sure, can be universal, but would probably hit way closer to home for queer viewers. The scene of Adam and his father comes to mind in that regard. To think of everything expressed during that moment not as a literal conversation but as a manifestation of Adam's deepest feelings makes the scene much more painful than it already was, but in no way less powerful in getting its message across. 